Minnesota. Welcome to today's interview. I'm talking to Johan Nylander. Uh, Johan has just published a book called The Epic Split, Why Made in China is Going Out of Style. Uh, I'm really curious to hear about that, Johan. But first of all, just give me a quick background on, on yourself and uh, what you do when you're not writing books. Um, well, so I have worked as a journalist for too many years, I would say, uh, all my career. Uh, I lived in uh, Hong Kong for the last uh, almost uh, 10 years now. Uh, I've been writing for uh, Forbes, for CNN, and my main job at the moment is uh, Asia correspondent for uh, Sweden's leading business newspaper, Dagens Industri. Uh, and when I don't write for them, I'm, I'm up early in the morning and uh, I, I, write, I write books trying to uh, explain for people across the world, like in, in Europe, in America, in Australia, uh, what is actually happening here in, in Asia and, and now specifically focusing on the, on the trade war and this like growing conflict between the world's two leading uh, economies. And your timing for publishing the book is impeccable. We're in a, at a point where I don't remember a year where manufacturing and supply chain has been so high on the agenda. We're in two months leading up to a presidential election where manufacturing incentives might not be the key topic, but they're certainly one of the key topics being discussed. The timing, the timing seems um, impeccable. Is that, is that deliberate or is that a, a coincidence? Um, well, I would say both. Um, naturally, I follow the main trends uh, working as an Asia correspondent, and this is the main trend, right? There's, there's nothing that, that is more important. And, um, uh, and then naturally, I wrote the book as fast as I, as I could. Uh, I was up early every morning hammering away uh, to get the book out uh, before the election. And as you say, the, the timing is very important in, in this um, uh, in this topic, and I mean, naturally, they, they're also they, these are big mega trends we are talking about. Mm. It's, it's, it's conflicts that have been running for for many years. So there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, there's a lot of shouting, not so much listening. So I thought it was important to to try to summarize what is happening, and 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 give an, a view where I look at the conflict not just from one side but from um, uh, multiple sides and, and try mm. to explain and, and get people to understand you know that this is this is actually pretty serious yeah and I think as an, as an observer that that is that is neither American or Chinese it's really you're in a you're in a very privileged and uh, and good position to do that so the epic split we'll talk a little bit about that but i'm also curious you say made in china is going out of style uh four trillion dollars worth of manufacturing occurs uh in china it's pretty hard to resource that elsewhere do you see that as a gradual process or you talk about a split as if it's something that's 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 you know almost like a tear that's something quite sudden is it something that's more gradual how do you see the timeline on that uh, both, as, as all academics, you say yes and no. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, the trend that um, manufacturing is, is leaving China is something that we've seen for almost a decade, right? Mm -hmm. It started in, you know, those notorious uh, factory towns where, where international companies were producing plastic toys or, or, or uh, like more like low-level manufacturing, textiles, mm -hmm. shoes, for example. The, those started moving out uh, years ago, right? Um, I don't know, uh, as, as a lot of people uh, who, who done sourcing in China, you, you've probably been to the, to the big factory town Dongguan in uh, uh, the Pearl River Delta. Yeah. Uh, I've been there a million times. And the last few times I've, I've been there, everywhere I see factories with big banners saying space for rent everywhere. Uh, you drive around the main factory areas, you see closed down factories or half, uh, half empty factories and big billboards uh, displaying discount for, uh, uh, for, for uh, renting space, right? So one thing is what you see in the data and the data is clear, uh, China's role in, in terms of uh, global manufacturing and, and, and export is, is sinking year by year in, in uh, relative terms. But also when you see it with your eyes, when you go traveling in China, in some of these 
um, some of these like mega cities, these, these uh, factory cities, they don't really transform into a modern economy. You see a lot of factories leaving, but nothing really new coming in. Um, and so that's the, the longer trend. And, and now with, uh, with the trade war and with the, uh, uh, the, uh, corona, the coronavirus uh, crisis that we've been uh, going through the last few months, there's a new urgency on lowering dependency uh, on one country for international companies to lowering their dependency on the Chinese uh, supply chain. So, so we see a rapid movement now with a lot of uh, American and Japanese, Korean, Taiwanese high-tech companies uh, moving out, gradually moving out, diversifying uh, manufacturing away from China. Yeah, and when you see that movement away from China, do you see it going anywhere in particular? We hear a lot about Vietnam, and then when I look at stuff returning to the Americas, I see more investment arriving in Mexico than perhaps in um, perhaps in the United States. What do you see as the trend there? Um, this is very fascinating because the the trend to to, to relocate to Vietnam is is quite clear. Uh, India. Mexico, Southeast Asia, Brazil, just to jump between the, the, the different parts of the world here. Um, they, they are scooping up a lot of uh, manufacturing and, and, and then export. Um, also a lot of Chinese companies are uh, relocating manufacturing, first because of it, uh, cheaper labor, but secondly, lower, less political headache, right? Um, there's also a lot of talk do, during the, the presidential election at the moment. There's a lot of talk about bringing American jobs back. I, I think that we see some trends towards reshoring, as we talk about, some manufacturing is actually moving back to the United States, to Europe. Um, it's not massive amounts yet at all, right? It, it's still, uh, the, the, the Europe and America, we lack those amazing supply chains that, that, that we have in China. But I think we will see a gradual shift, a gradual uh, movement towards uh, a rebuilding of supply chains in, in, uh, in more uh, expensive countries also. But at the moment, it's Vietnam is absolutely uh, the big winner and uh, Southeast Asia, Mexico, Brazil, India. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really interesting when you look at those economies that are winning. Um, and the other thing I, I think about some of those, and you talk about Chinese companies moving, um, but when I look at it from an electronic manufacturing industry, it's those huge Taiwanese companies that have the big mm -hmm. footprint in China that are now investing heavily in India, investing heavily in the Americas, but more specifically in Mexico, and also investing in... Uh, in Vietnam as well. I think there's some, um, some fascinating trends there. What do you think about the role of digital transformation? When you talk about perhaps China not, not have being able to um, keep pace with changes in terms of manufacturing, do you see digital transformation as a leveler? Is that something that's going to create more opportunity in maybe some of the high cost environments as we as we transform our industry industry to something that's perhaps more automated, more digitally enabled? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, China is the biggest investor in, in uh, robotics, automation uh, in the world. They are, in, 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 in terms of like robots per worker, they are uh, behind a lot, right? But, but they are uh, investing more than anyone. So that is absolutely coming. I think China is doing a really great job in modernizing its uh, economy. Um, my last book was about the city Shenzhen, like right across the border mm -hmm. from uh, Hong Kong, like Asia's Silicon Valley. So my last book w was actually about China modernizing its economy. The new book is about the, the trade war and new decisions that, um, have, uh, that business leaders and politicians have to make. But so I see, I see like different trends in China in terms of modernizing its economy. If you look at Shenzhen, they are goddamn awesome at what they're doing. Like I'm highly impressed what I, what I see there. Shanghai, Beijing, they're really good at what they're doing, Hangzhou. But other parts of, of the countries, other sectors, they don't really catch up, right? So I think 
you have hundreds of millions of uh, migrant workers who go to the big factories. Now a lot of, a lot of those people are, are uh, out of work because of the virus and automation, uh, robotization is going to make it even more difficult for these people to, to find jobs. The talk about they, they will be scooped up in, into service industry, um, but also those are quite uh, uh, low advanced, uh, uh, low level jobs. So I think it, it's it's hard to tr uh, you can transform some parts of the country, some some sectors, but but to transform the whole country, like like uh, Europe did, America did, Australia, um, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, with a country with 1.4 uh, billion people, I think it's 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 a big challenge. I mean, we shall remember that China is it's a big, um, rich country with uh, still a poor population. A, a, a clear majority of of people in China don't have much money uh, to spend. Uh, so I think it's a massive challenge to 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 uh, transform the the uh, the whole economy. Part of the economy, absolutely, it's happening the whole economy, I think is very, very difficult. Yeah, and you know, just, just touching briefly on the um, presidential election, do you think when you look at this trend, do you look at what's going on, do you think it's gonna go a different way if one or the other is elected, or do you see no, no real impact on this, on this um, situation? When I look at their policies, uh, I don't see clear, clear blue water between them, and I don't see any of them having what I would consider to be the right incentives to modernize and create a, a, an exciting modern manufacturing industry in their own base. Does it matter who wins to you? Um, well, I, I, I think if, if, if Trump wins, he's not just gonna continue to unleash his, his dogs towards China and with more aggressions. If, if Joe Biden wins, I, I think he will, continue to keep the same amount of pressure on China, but slightly more sophisticated. Um, the biggest uh, thing he will do that will strengthen America's role against China in this conflict is that he will uh, create alliances with other uh, equal-minded countries, like the, the European countries, uh, Australia. Australia is, is in a big conflict with uh, with China, like a bigger conflict mm. than the United States is, I would, I, I would argue. And, um, and Japan and other uh, democracies, possibly India, uh, uh, democratic countries in Southeast Asia. Joe Biden will probably align all, all these uh, countries who, who, who have a belief in, in, in a free, liberal, uh, democratic uh, society in, in, uh, compared with China's uh, authoritarian system. I think that would happen if, if Joe Biden wins. And, and yet, yes, to add to the question, the conflict between the United States and China is a lot of people, they, they, uh, they talk about Donald Trump and Xi Jinping, like two wild horses, two, 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 two wolves fighting. But this is a conflict that's been boiling for, for a long time. Um, some argue even since China joined the WTO. Uh, if you look at feelings among the American population, like if you if you see favorably or unfavorably yeah. on China, it's been a negative trend for more than 15 years. Mm. The American population today have an incredible negative view on China. Like a clear majority, or oh, more than 70-80% see China as something negative. And a record number of people in America, they see China as the number one threat to the American way of life. So if you had terror organizations like Al-Qaeda or uh, you know, the, the old Russian enemy, if they were the one who kept you know, people awake at night, now it's China, the rise of China, that's the main threat. So this is not a conflict that's, that's going away anytime yeah. soon. As I see it, it's gonna just escalate uh, the years coming. Yeah, and it's not just related to the political cycle. There's much more to it than that. Johan, you're a Swedish Swedish guy living in Hong Kong. I'm an English guy living in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, very displaced, but we've both spent a lot of time traveling and watching what's going on in the world. What, is, what does this mean to our hometown of Europe? What is, what is the impact of the, uh, the, 
the the epic split between China and the US uh, mean to Europe? Well, I think Europe for like a long time has been trying to uh, align its interests. I think the internal politics in Europe within the European Union is, is they're doing a really good job. The external politics, the, the foreign politics, it's very divided. Like there's no one clear voice. How are we going to respond to, to America? How are we going to respond to China? Individual countries are stepping up their games. Um, I, I, I would say that the United Kingdom is taking a, a clear stance uh, next to uh, United States, so is uh, Australia, Sweden, uh, that I come from, ha has a quite, it's, it's in the media shadows a bit, but it's, it, it has a quite fierce conflict with China at the moment. Um, the China's ambassador in Sweden has been, they had to take him in the ear and drag him to the foreign office I don't know, 50, 60, 70, 80 times over the last two years. And, um, and this is connected to, to mainly to human rights. Mm -hmm. uh, Swedish citizens, Gui Minghai, has been uh, arrested in, 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 in China. And, and uh, so, so there's been a lot, of, um, a lot of conflicts between China and, and Sweden. And I think, um, and a lot of other countries are also mm. speak more clearly like what they actually believe in standing up for, for European or Swedish uh, values, right? And this again, I think if, if Joe Biden wins, uh, he will align these interests uh, stronger going forward. But yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a really curious challenge. And looking forward, um, I'm, I'm, look, I'm very much looking forward to the book, but give me the conclusion. Give me the last chapter, the... Uh, what, what do you see as the outcome? You see more of the same, you see um, winners in those countries you've mentioned, um, Brazil, India, Central America, maybe Eastern Europe, Vietnam, particularly Southeast Asia. What's, what's the yeah. big conclusion? What's the big takeaway? Well, I think the big conclusion is that we are, we are facing like the biggest breakup the world has ever seen like, between mm -hmm. the two largest economies authoritarian china and uh america and and uh, uh in it in, in its like allied uh democratic countries um supply chain manufacturing uh, absolutely uh, gradually moving away from china china's era as the world factory is is uh, fading uh, manufacturing mm -hmm. is is moving to india southeast asia vietnam and also back to uh uh, to, to, to Brazil and, and, and to Mexico, closer to home for American companies. Um, something that's very important is we, we're not just talking about uh, supply chain. You also see an epic split, if, if you want, in, in finance. We talk about mm -hmm. the financial decoupling. Uh, we talk about on the internet, everything digital. We talk about the split internet, like a Chinese internet, and then a world internet. Mm. Um, and there's also... A misconception that you know normal people on the street they they don't really bother with this conflict right but i don't think that's quite true there's a massive trend in in america in europe in 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 asia not to buy products made in china mm. uh there's tons of uh campaigns anti-made china campaigns and there's uh, a lot of research that i've seen who's saying that consumers in america they prefer to buy products not made in China. They are willing to pay a premium for, for, com for, for products uh, not made there. So as, as a company leader, you can actually um, move manufacturing away from China. You can lower your cost, you can lower your uh, political headache, and you mm -hmm. make your customers more happy. So yeah. uh, this is a trend that's quite clear uh, and I see this will just uh, uh, accelerate uh, yeah. going forward. Yeah, no, and I think uh, what you talk about brand appeal and, and sentiment, I think, is really important. I, it, it is even bigger than the than the political trends, the trends within within countries to not just be anti-China, but to a degree, there's a little bit of anti-globalization going on. There's a very, there's a slightly protectionist sentiment, almost a xenophobic sentiment, which, uh, you know, as Europeans, we know we ha you have to be 
very, very careful and very cautious about those, uh, those kind of things. Just, just thinking forward, what's the, what's the big vision for the future? If we look at supply chain and manufacturing in 10 years time, do we think it's going to be much more regionalized, much more in country for country? Once we get this digital transformation, do we see more of a level playing field going forward? You know, what, what's the book you're going to be writing in? Uh, I know it's a long way forward, but what's the book you're going to be writing in <laughs> 10 years time? And, and what's the industry that you're going to be talking about then? Oh, that's a very interesting question. That's a very interesting question. Um, I think going forward, I, I don't think we will have a massive deglobalization. I think the way we do business is by uh, collaborating, right? Um, I think it's really hard to, to, to isolate yourself from, from the rest of the world. China is trying to do it now. They're raising their walls. Um, a small country like Sweden, 10 million people, impossible, right? Um, even, even America, they have a massive home market, but I think also they are like dependent on, on global trade. What I think will, uh, will happen is that China will still be a major uh, manufacturer. It will be a major uh, global economy. It might be the world's biggest economy because they have so much people. Um, but we will continue to, to collaborate. And a lot of manufacturing will move to new countries and I hope uh, that the political situation in China might have become more humane mm. going forward. There might be steps in, in, in a more humane direction and that I think will, will create new, new friendships uh, across the, the globe because as we said today the main, the main conflict is not, is not trade, right? The trade war is not about trade, it's about two competing ideologies right that, that just don't go hand in hand yeah. not in the long run yeah and china's tried to tread the fine line of both of those and uh, yeah they do fundamentally jar and that's that's one of the huge challenges i'm kind of with you i see this future where uh, where we do return to a, a, a solid global global model, but we have more in region manufacturing and, and shorter supply chains, which excite me from a sustainability point of view and for lots of other good reasons. And countries like Vietnam and, uh, and India as winners in, the, in that manufacturing equation will have the opportunity to increase the size of their middle class and create some good um, sustainable jobs in those regions as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And then putting the layer of digital transformation on top of that, I think creates mm -hmm. creates an interesting an interesting future. And I think it's really interesting what you say about China kind of coming back around at some point and and creating this uh, environment where where they maybe uh, play nicer with everybody because at the moment they're upsetting everybody in the school playground and. Uh, uh, and it's, you know, it's not, it's not easy um, to, to see a way through that. Johan, I'm very much looking forward to reading the book and very much looking forward to talking to you again and uh, um, finding out how things, are, how things are progressing there. Great to have someone that's um, so close to the ground and, see, and, and can see exactly what's going on. Thank you so much for your time today and thanks for chatting to me. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, it's really a, a pleasure speaking to you.